to talk uh, with two of uh, design's brightest mind, with Julien Dombray, uh, one of the co-founders of Carpenter's Workshop Gallery, and Harry Nureyev, which would be hard to describe in just one word, uh, because he touches on design, on architecture, on scenography, on fashion which uh, Carpenter's Workshop Gallery also does, uh, and we're going to go in-depth into um, what they do. Uh, so starting and diving in with Crosby Studio, which is your practice, Harry, um, and this picture which uh, already starts uh, drawing a new dimension in design. Uh, what are we looking at and what is this? Is it an object? Is it a scenography? Is it a space? Is it an architecture? Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, yeah, we, um, I guess we're going to talk about collectible design outside of the boundaries, right? And that's what we try to do with our studio, with our practice, to blend different disciplines together, specifically uh, art, fashion, design, architecture. So we see already that uh, you've got quite a following and it's beyond the borders of strict design and functional design. We're seeing here quite a few covers and objects that were profiled around the globe. Uh, how, how, what is your relationship between design and fashion? Is it something you like to, to go from one to the other that you combine always, that you look at one to invent the other? Um, I, I work for fashion. I'm not in fashion, but I work for fashion and uh, I take inspiration for fashion. I give inspiration to fashion and it's just a two very close and very far away from each other uh, industry that can inspire me for actually the last 10 years because we turned 10 years anniversary and we celebrate an anniversary this year. So then, hello, Julien. <laughs> hello. You co-founded Carpenter's Workshop with uh, the idea of broadening maybe the scene of design from the start, of looking at projects and designers that had their own way with design. With my business partner, Loïc Le Gaillard, yes, we, we did create uh, Carpenter's Workshop Foundry 18 years ago. And uh, we are both uh, very uh, uh, fond of art. And uh, at the time, there was a lot of galleries in this market, and we... We tried to find our own uh, personality, and we are also we are very interested in the fact that an, an object could become an art piece, and we decided to focus our gallery on this frontier between art and design. Wonderful. So that was the moment where design art was on every lips, and I think with Ladbroke Hall, which opened almost a year ago now, uh, you've, you've crossed a new border. Um, it's, a, it's a new frontier for design because it's beyond just a gallery space. It's a maverick um, place uh, in, in London. And I'd like um, for you to kind of tell us what's going on because here's an idea of the program. Uh, here, you, before, you've just seen a, a picture of the whole Ladbroke Hall itself, which is a historical building. And uh, if you could walk, walk us through this new uh, project, this new space, uh, this intention. Yes, our, um, our mission in design is always to sacralize uh, our artists and uh, their productions. And the context where we uh, install these pieces are very important. So we, dis we started with, uh, with a wide cube space, very formal, uh, art uh, venues, and with time, we uh, we thought that it could be interesting to to show these pieces in a more uh, of a, a daily context uh, of uh, pieces where you could live and you could have a, a real way of life within those those spaces. So, Ladbroke Hall is a gallery space, but it's also a, a restaurant. It's also a, a concert hall. Uh, it's a place where we do uh, talks and uh, we have asked some artists to participate to the space and to see how we could all live in interaction with always this uh, art, uh, this artistic uh, uh, line uh, that connects everything. 
So we're already seeing that design is taking many different uh, functions and many different scales. I think in Ladbroke Hall, you go from the jewelry space to this uh, gi gigantic installation by an, an, uh, Nacho Carbonell to the event space and to st uh, large sculptures. Huh? Yes, it's um, the scale is uh, has never been an issue for uh, for us. We love big projects uh, like this beautiful. Uh, uh, kind of giant uh, chandelier by Nacho Carbonell, who takes the, the almost the whole space, which has been made uh, especially for the space. But we uh, we also love the challenge of very small pieces and uh, jewelry or smaller items that we can. Uh, we will be launching soon uh, some uh, art de la table uh, pieces. Uh, so uh, it's not. Uh, sometimes it's more difficult to do smaller pieces than big pieces, but it's made with the, the same intentions, and we give it the same importance. Yeah, we'll get back to that of the idea of changing scale and keeping the same quality of design. And Harry, um, here we see a quite a. a futuristic, maybe, uh, design space that uh, the Alexander Wang store in New York. What was the idea behind it? How, what did you want to explore in this, uh, in this space? A few years ago, I invented my own style, which I call transformism. And uh, it's uh, alternative reality that I believe and I live in. It's an apocalyptic future where we no longer have any factor in production, so we have to repurpose things that surround us, not recycle or upcycle, but repurpose. And this store is a pure representation of my idea where a uh, piece of cars and elements from our domestic life taken over and become in a dom uh, objects and art pieces. And here we see another uh, intervention of yours where, again, we don't know if it's a design object, if it's a room, uh, the scale is completely different and you're playing uh, between the functionality, the scenography, uh, and the space. This is one of the recent work, no longer exists, uh, was made for our studio in Paris, and uh, the, here we represent a combination between history um, and traditional Parisian architecture and futuristic approach of um, Devel that we might gonna end up in, in one day, where we'll have to live in a capsule. And here we're back to the number one slide, which was a store uh, in the Palais Royal. So talking about history and, uh, and the weight of beautiful uh, historical grounds and walls, uh, what, uh, what was the idea here? Here, idea was to combine um, energy uh, and aura of Palais Royal and take the old, raw, exposed, uh, dusty, beautiful walls inside but reinterpreted with mirrors and drawings uh, through our vision and because of the mirror reflecting the garden all the places intertwine in one area and makes you feel a bit lost uh, in time and in space lost in time and in space that's another uh uh, confrontation of uh, centuries because it's a 18th century Gloriette that you reinterpreted for Mobilier National. With this project, we were very honored to work with uh, Mobilier National and uh, Minister of Culture France, where we reinterpreted 17th century tapestry and uh, we um, create a space that kind of remind one of the tapestry um, scene, and we use AI to add uh, some elements to this tapestry because obviously we can't use the real material because it's, um, um, it's preserved and it's good that some things can preserve in this world and we can't touch them. Um, so adding that new frontier of AI on top of it to create spaces or to multiply the dimensions here it feels like a, it's very much like a video game. Uh, it's a store for Jimmy Choo, uh, where you played on, on what we perceive? Uh, uh, speaking of AI, the previous project is real. We just use AI for create the print for the tapestry. But for the next one, uh, this store was uh, made in uh, last year at um, 
Avenue Mountain, and the idea was to take you back of a house of um, traditional retail, the things that we usually try to hide, the secrets of the real uh, uh, glamorous world, back of a house. And it was the first time exposed to public where shoeboxes become in display. And we're back to this idea of cultural venues, of prototyping, of exploring. And I want to come back to Ladbroke Hall because it's, it's quite a quite a vanguard in the way it brings together so many uh, specificities and, and design elements. So again, we see the natural carbonyl uh, piece, which is fabulous. And then under it, there's a bar that's no less fabulous, uh, which was designed by Vic Vicenzo De Cotis. Uh, how did you come about to, uh, to customize, to prototype such an such a incredible piece for the venue? First, we, we found this venue, which, uh, which uh, has a, a very strong uh, identity, and uh, we needed to, uh, to find a project that would, uh, that would be uh, strong enough and at the same time respecting this uh, identity, which, uh, which uh, the building is, comes from uh, 1903, so there's been some, uh, some stories uh, before us. Um, we wanted to do a restaurant for uh, since the beginning in this uh, in this space an uh, Italian restaurant which is uh, all uh, uh, today run by uh, Italian chef Emanuele Polini and uh, it came naturally that Vincenzo De Cotis who uh, comes from Milan could uh, could be the perfect uh, artist to uh, to design this space, and uh, he did it in a, in a beautiful way, which is very subtle and very present in the same time. And what is great is even if it's uh, if it's there and present, it allows to have other artists to uh, to express themselves, like Nacho Carbonell, but also there are four uh, uh, massive uh, paintings by Christopher Lebrun uh, and other. Uh, um, exhibitions uh, of photographs uh, or painting that we do uh, uh, above the, the tables. The, right now, it's uh, we have uh, uh, pieces by Irvin Penn. And it's interesting to see that we're beyond the gallery space where it's do not touch the objects. They're precious. Uh, it's something do not sit. And here suddenly it's a bar where you order a drink. Uh, you can touch and feel and see what it's like to live with these pieces. It's, uh, it's the whole idea that we try to develop since day one with Carpenter's Workshop Gallery. It's to, to live with, uh, with art in an in a, in a easy way. Uh, a table, if you can't uh, touch it, uh, is a problem to me. So it's important that uh, people can live in their space without feeling living in a museum. And you can have very fine furniture that could be also very functional. And I think we're seeing also that you're playing with inside and outside. Uh, you, have, you have always uh, looked at sculpture uh, and at putting sculptures outside and at bringing designers into the culture, in the sculpture and external space, which you also do at La Brocola. Huh? Absolutely. It's, uh, we have the chance to have a, a garden at La Brocola and there is a lot of... Uh, uh, pieces outside right now we have Wendell Castle like these pieces in bronze but uh, we also have uh, an installation by uh, Korean artist Wan Min Park and also we have a Jean Prouvé uh, house from the Refugee de Lorraine uh, which, uh, which can host uh, some, uh, some, uh, some guests. So again, breaking the boundaries of what uh, collectible design is actually known for. Um, here we see uh, some of the pieces by uh, Women Park um, that he designed um, uh, for you. And then you work also a lot with customizing and commissioning uh, pieces huh, with designers. You work hand in hand with, uh, to organize um, exhibitions. Uh, it's not just, oh, that's a great project, let's show it. It's like, what do we want to do next? So we, um, our very first uh, our mission is to be a gallery. And as a gallery, we are producing exhibitions. So we talk with artists and we, uh, we see what they would like to express. And this comes with one exhibition. But after... 
this, that this exhibition is produced with uh, maybe 10 objects, 10 pieces. We, uh, we, we are developing some uh, private commissions for uh, custom, uh, cust custom uh, houses and special clients. Um, so here we're seeing quite a few of the studios, uh, no, sorry, um, that you work with, no? Uh. This is Batten and Camp uh, studio, they, they are a new, uh, new artist uh, just in uh, the gallery and they are coming from New Zealand. Okay. So quite bold spaces and then this is one that's very close to your heart, uh, Ingrid Dona. Uh, and uh, how uh, we're going into the intricacy of the details on that piece, huh? Yes, the, the lady in the middle of the, the, the artisan here is Ingrid Donat, an amazing artist who happens to be my mother. And that's actually how I started in, uh, in this adventure. Uh, I was uh, 20 years old, uh, my mother was 40 at the time, and we literally started working for the first time. Uh, on our own and together and uh, it was supposed to be on my side just to help for a few months just to launch her uh, her activity and uh, it happened to uh, to run my life so here we're seeing some of carpenters workshops uh, gallery spaces which are all very different and i think that's also is a, a way of expressing that you're out of the white cube, um, that you, the spaces are very different and, and they're tied to a market, uh, different sensibilities or different means uh, of expression. We are two French uh, co-founders, but we have started in London. Uh, or the our very first uh, gallery was there in the former Carpenters Workshop. That's where come the name from. And, uh, and then we developed Paris because I was commuting a lot because I'm in charge of the production of the pieces. And uh, I, uh, I tried to develop uh, some pieces with uh, English artisans, but it was not that easy than in France. So we decided to focus in France where uh, I believe there's the best handcraft in the world, maybe with Italy. And uh, so then we, we opened the gallery in, uh, in Paris and, uh, and then New York and Los Angeles came after. And for us, it's very important to represent our artists globally. It's not a uh, design world. is not like the art, art world where you have a lot of galleries and a lot of artists. And sometimes the, 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 gallery, the, the artists are uh, represented by s different galleries in the design it's not the case so if you really want to have your artists to have an international international audience you need to have uh, galleries in uh, in the most important cities in the world and to participate to fairs as well so we're seeing a little bit of the paris gallery different very different spaces uh, uh, the apartment in uh, the paris gallery and then let's go back to you, Harry, because this was at Carpenter's Workshop uh, in Paris. And it was quite uh, a stunner uh, because suddenly you brought denim to another level. And I almost feel when I discovered this space that you brought denim into des the design world where it didn't really belong. It belonged in fashion. How did you come about with this uh, incredible installation? Um, so I was uh, incredibly lucky to have a solo show last year with Julian and the team uh, of Carpenters in Paris. And uh, we had carte blanche and idea was to actually bring real material from different industry, which was for me naturally fashion. And denim is the material of the time, which has been material of the time for the last couple of decades, never been introduced and designed properly. And I was thinking that can actually go there. I don't think it's design, I think it's art, because it's not really 100% functional thing, you know, in terms of durable material and other uh, aspects that comes to service. Uh, but it was a great experiment that probably pushed a little bit boundaries of what's important today. It wasn't made for uh, quick TikTok or for set a trend or anything like that. It was just a um, our action as artists to say that 
this world it's not black and white, not that square. And sometimes the things that we used to wear can be and on the furniture. And uh, being a sofa. So here we see another view. This exhibition was really something uh, uh, very important to us and very different. All the, 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 the artists we work with, they, they've been creating pieces for today. It's, uh, it's how to, uh, to make our today's living better and to inscribe a new creation in design art of today. Harry came with a proposition on how to live in the future. And it was very challenging because... Uh, we had no idea, but he had this very clear I idea of how could it be. He actually also designed architecture in, uh, in 3D, which are incredible, with uh, uh, new houses floating in the space with, uh, with beautiful uh, landscapes that come from uh, our origin and, and space related as well. And to imagine how we, uh, we could live tomorrow was very interesting for me as a, as a gallerist. And I think we're seeing how, how many things can be challenged. The function can be challenged, the material can be fa uh, f uh, challenged, the way uh, we live with the pieces and the way we react, we touch them, the way we project ourselves in the future, the way uh, we live with scenography, because it was quite uh, cinematographic as well. You had uh, created that film um, that brought us uh, into living uh, digitally with the pieces. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think function and materials have been challenged already and explored left and right. I think what's challenging now is to, you know, uh, find a room in your attention and try to be present. You know, we live in a TikTok era and it's sometimes it's hard to focus on one second. Like we try to make people sit here for 45 minutes. I don't know how they're going to stand it. You know, there, <laughs> we live in a world in 20 seconds right now. And yeah. uh, this project was very much about uh, go outside of... Um, frame of function and you know what is sexy what is design what is artist and just try to make some statement which was very successful and here there's another uh, quite unique installation also challenging uh, what is function uh, what can be used as a material uh, how we can change the the vision i love this uh, this piece and um, all these pieces because this is really the the concept that we, uh, we have from the beginning at the gallery that comes from Marcel Duchamp, who challenges the, 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 the notion of art. What is art? And uh, um, the artist decides what is art. And that's what is interesting. And, uh, and this uh, trash bag sofa is really the expression of that. But it takes a good gallerist to understand um, that it's art too. So it takes for the galleries to understand that it's art. <laughs> but we, uh, we've for been sure. challenged a lot on, the, on the, should it be art and should it be design? And this is a debate that we don't understand. It's, uh, a lot of people talk about it, and love, but uh, for us it's not relevant. Whether you have an artist with an artistic expression which is relevant into the the history of, of art, because it's new ideas, it's a new way of express, expressing some ideas. And if it's relevant because it's genuine, between, because it's authentic, because it's creative, it, ha it has, to me, its place into the art world. So what are we looking at? It's, it's a piece by Harry again. Um, here we're looking at the office chair that looks like it's completely destroyed by time. And uh, come back to my story about 20 seconds attention right now. You know, when you don't have to read book anymore, you can just download it and just have a um, short bullets of the most important um, information. That uh, it challenges us to speak, challenges us to design, to cr develop our art. And all that we can do is to look at the problems and use this platform to speak about problems. So this particular one is talking about consumption. 
in an era of consumption when we want more and more and everything has to be new and then we protect these new things. You know, when we buy a phone, we buy a case for phone. When we buy a suitcase, which is, suitcase is already a case for your clothes and clothes is already a case for your body. And then now we use case for your suitcase to protect it. So the idea of protection and fear of scratches and damages um, combined with consumption this chair was about. Wonderful. And this is another piece you did for Nike, yeah? Um, this project I did uh, uh, quite a while ago. It was the first project we did with Nike, and I guess it was the first furniture uh, piece. And uh, when they asked me, when they commissioned me to think of their uh, campaign or whatever it was about, I don't even remember, but I suggest to do furniture. And they said, well, we're we're a uh, sport wear brand. We don't produce furniture. We don't care about the furniture. But I found interesting thing that designer uh, who developed one of this um, Air Max, uh, original one actually, he said, in order to design shoes, you have to design chair first. And I basically did a mash to his word and did all the way around. So in order to design something, you design something else. Clever. Which is chair <laughs> of uh, shoes. Looking at uh, Allo, another installation you did for Design Miami? Um, I practice yoga uh, most of my life. And uh, uh, yoga brick, it's something that elevates you from the earth because it's something that helps you to be a little bit uh, higher than your body possibly can. So, you know, and this physicality of the brick uh, and inspire me to create sofa, the things that actually live, elevate you from, from the floor. So very simple ideas sometimes, very complex ideas at other times, uh, art-led. And we, we talked a lot when we prepared this conference about the next design frontier. And we've touched upon it already of how do we, we live in the future, how will we combine spaces. Uh, and here I think is a, is a wonderful uh, example of what you designed for Balenciaga, of bringing a lot of elements together um, to create what it looks like an art installation, a scenography, a piece you want to interact with, uh, a collectible, uh, but also a very usable uh, element. For this piece, I was talking about copy and copy and copy, and a copy machine made out of the wood, uh, which turned into credenza, and uh, Xerox becoming a piece of art or furniture object representing an um, idea of infinity of copies that we live in right now. And copy, it's not necessarily things that we take in from other people and copy them. Copy can be something that you did yourself and then you copy yourself. So it's just about, again, cons consumption and unnecessary amount of things that we surround ourselves with. Another tapestry sofa. Um... And then again, we're back to uh, seeing this beautiful installation, uh, denim installation, that pushes the boundaries of what is a sofa? Uh, what do we do on a sofa? Yeah. What is interesting, it's actually the, the title of the piece is, it's not a sofa, it's a pool, because you're, uh, you're able to, to dive in. And uh, again, it's uh, how we might be living in, in, in the future. Is This is a sofa, but it's also a place where you can have... Uh, uh, you can eat, you can sleep, you, you can hang out, you can work, you can listen to music, you can watch a movie. Uh, it's, uh, there's also a lot of modularity in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this piece, and that's also what is very interesting. It's, uh, it's, it's a sofa, but it's also a, a thousand of different things in the same time. And not only solo player, you can meet, uh, you can gather. Uh, it feels like something that brings together. And I think that's one of the elements of your design, Harry, is you bring things together, you bring people together. Uh, there's something that, uh, that attracts people. Uh, what is it? What am I seeing? Uh, especially with the mirrors and, and the different reflections. And um, one project uh, we wanted to touch uh, upon, uh, because we've been talking about the projection of 
design into the future. And I think Martin Bass installation and the play with time, this children's clock, uh, and then the different play times. I just wanted to touch on this idea of time. Uh, time passes, you collect uh, to keep over time, but at the same time, it's, it's, you, can't, um, you can't stop time. It's, um, Martin Bass has uh, developed this beautiful idea of real time with, uh, with people drawing the time uh, in, uh, in real time. That means that here you, you see this, this is a children's clock, so it's been made with uh, an association with the children that would draw the minutes and then the other minutes, another minute. So you have the, the, the real time on a real clock but in the same time, it's a, it's a video and it's a performance by an artist, uh, kids or other people. And so it's a, it, it, it's a sculpture that gives time. So it's, a, it's art, but at the same time, it's a very functional piece. Uh, we're looking at also uh, the importance of always following and investing and believing in designers whose name we haven't heard of. Uh, and I think you're very, very aware of the new design scene at Carpenter's Workshop and you're always spot on when it's, when it's about discovering new talents and bringing them along uh, at the gallery. And also, um, I'll insist on, on the importance of new materials and new ways of approaching material, materiality. We, uh, we started the, the gallery with, uh, the, with the artists which were not artists at the time because uh, they were students. Uh, we couldn't manage at the, at the time to work with real artists because we, uh, we, were, we were not uh, structured enough. And uh, so we, uh, we went to uh, graduation shows in different schools. We started with the Eindhoven Design Academy and the Royal College of Art in London. And uh, that's where we discovered students that uh, became uh, important actors then of the design art scene. And, uh, and then with time uh, and being more structured, we kept this uh, DNA that we have, which is to try to, to find talent where it is. So we are constantly seeking for new talents, the new generation that will uh, bring uh, interesting uh, concepts uh, to us. We'll see other great new designers uh, soon, like Lea Mestres, who has a... a a, un a universe of her own, uh, really, like she brings, uh, like you, uh, Ari, uh, when you see her design, suddenly you're projected into another dimension. Um, and then Martin Laforet, whose work I, I personally really uh, think is, is incredible and ahead of its time, uh, working with concrete and giving a completely different uh, notion of what concrete is. At Carpenter's Workshop Gallery, we... Uh, we uh, we are representing a very different artists, but they all have their very defined uh, aesthetic, uh, philosophy, thinking, and that's what is the most important to us. As I was saying previously, what is the most important to us is not necessarily uh, how it looks, but more what it expresses, and that this expression uh, adds something uh, to, the, to the bigger history. Great. Um, and then something that we announced was, you know, could there be a new definition of collectible design? Because a bit like design art, what is design, what is art, and what is design art? A lot of people um, asked me recently, what is collectible design? And that's uh, quite a, a vast uh, question to ask because you could collect anything you really like. A collector will, uh, will collect small pieces, bigger pieces, and there is kind of this media attention towards collectible design. And I think maybe one of the answers is the el in the element of detail and uh, the importance of uh, intense craftsmanship. Uh, and I think uh, these pieces, especially uh, Ingrid's piece in the middle, uh, shows an intricate uh, amount of details. First of all, I don't really like the expression collectible design. I I prefer, uh, and we use uh, functional art uh, because it's, uh, it comes from uh, an artistic ID which has a function, but the functionality is not the most important. What is more important is all the, the thinking uh, behind. And what would define this area is uh, 
for sure that it has to be collectible, but not every pieces could be collectible. It has to be collectible for uh, an intrinsic reason. So when you have a pieces which is made uh, uh, in a limited edition, for example, because it's made uh, all in bronze with uh, with the original sculpture, molds, handcrafts, working, working on it, you can't make uh, thousands of them. So, so it makes collectible. Also, when the artists decide to make, evolve their creation and not to do the one uh, top seller piece, and that's also what makes it interesting that artists try to rethink uh, what could be the next and not uh, surfing on the previous success. And also um, knowing you, also trusting the designers and the artists and giving them a carte blanche and trusting that their process, if they're completely free, will give way to something very new or, or something that uh, they relate to. Um. We've, we've always tried to... Uh, we, we thought of our role uh, in uh, creating the best um, um, environment for artists to be able to create. So it comes from uh, uh, first from the creation, from the ideas, trying to push them to to go even further of what they they thought. And then it's been uh, about production, which is something very important to us, and try to find solutions for the for, for the production uh, to make those pieces exist as. Uh, uh, as they were imagined by artists, and then is to try to make uh, uh, to, to, to put them on the market so they have a real life. It's not just for museum. It's just not cr uh, crazy ideas. It's important that it goes into collections and into museums, and so that's where the, the gallery side uh, and placing the object is also makes part of the process. Um, thank you. So I'm, I've been going through slides of showing how uh, they can be placed in in, uh, in space and how we can live with them, how we can uh, be challenged by them also. Um, they can re redefine the space. And here we're back to with you, Harry, on uh, some very simple um, but really bright and clever uh, elements of design. Sometimes I feel you're back to uh, the essence uh, of the material. Uh, what is a line, what is an angle, uh, what is a chainsaw. Uh, you could speak a little bit about this piece. So this speaks uh, speak about quality and the low quality of the image that we used to uh, dodge from um, our work when, when we work in a, in, uh, on a material level or in carpenter level or even just in an image digital level, we have this low quality of things that we don't like for some reason. And I found beauty in it, and I decide to turn traditional Orlex chair to this low quality pixelated image that became a stainless steel piece. So always challenging the perception, challenging the perception of what is furniture. And we're seeing again those, uh, those images of elevating self, uh, headlight chandelier, uh, which is a, uh, you know... Uh, into the, into the light, uh, stop being stared at by the light of a car. And I think the car element is, is also part of, of things you like to, uh, to work around. Huh? I mean, at it's, the it's, end of the day, it's a light. It's either the car light or anything else. It's a light, and the light can serve anywhere, inside, outside. And if it will take this third tip of what the material and what the function is, and then we'll just play with uh, objects and try to replace them by replacement, we can find a new uh, interesting territory. So challenging the function, um, coming to very simple designs. Um, and then uh, to finish up this conference, we wanted to look at how design can be expressed outside. And I think the great example here uh, in front of the Centre Pompidou, we see the Jean, uh, pr uh, the Jean Prouvé uh, pavilion uh, in, at Labrock Hall in the backyard uh, and also sculptures that have been installed. So I, I'd like to come back to how design uh, is not only for interior spaces, how it can live outside and how it can be scaled up. Again, I, I feel that the design or functional art as we do, as, as, as we like to do it, is, uh, uh, is, is sculpture, is functional sculpture. And you have this tradition of 
garden of sculpture and the sculpture are, are, are meant to be outdoor uh, at the beginning and uh, and uh, and the design pieces as well and uh, uh, we thought with the Wendell Castle pieces that it could be uh, very uh, interested to uh, to have these pieces in bronze uh, whether than the, in uh, in wood as Wendell was uh, originally uh, making them because they are big and massive and it's uh, easier to place in the garden rather than in a, your home and uh, and this is another example of a pavilion uh, which is uh, also a, an amazing uh, uh, way of uh, doing functional art uh, this is atelier van lichout uh, installation uh, which was uh, uh, made in front of so uh, Centre Georges Pompidou called the Domesticator, and you could really uh, go inside, and there was uh, uh, different rooms, and uh, in the head you had a bedroom that you could use actually. We're looking at a lot of uh, different explorations of uh, a very original dwelling as well, uh, many capsule hotels that you designed like 22 years ago. Uh, that was very, the very beginning. Yeah, that was. Uh, that was one of the very first uh, design Basel participation, and uh, there, w there was uh, in front of the of the of the fair a space that was not used, and we asked, could we bring a crazy piece there and do a project? And they said yes, and we brought this uh, mini hotel uh, made by uh, uh, Atelier van Lichelt that looks like uh, I don't know the word in English, but the, where you put dead bodies. Uh, uh, in a uh, in a row in a, in a closet, uh, oh. like uh, yeah. I don't know how you say that. But so whether. it was quite a con uh, quite a crazy as as an idea. And uh, what was amazing is is that, so there was six rooms, and because in Basel there was a lot of uh, Basel uh, for 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 the fair is always. Uh, fully booked in the hotels and a lot of uh, artists and designers ask us you know what we uh, we are here for the day could we stay overnight in the hotel and the hotel was used every day and there was a post-it uh, thing of reservation it was not supposed to be like this but it happened to be like this and then we had this uh, quite nice surprise of selling this uh, huge piece to Brad Pitt, which uh, gave uh, to uh, Atelier Van Lichard and to uh, Or Gallery uh, a big exposure. And again, crossing borders of what is design, what is architecture. Uh, again, architecture brought into uh, the garden. Uh, so the Maison des Montables that you can see in London at Ladbroke Hall. And then other installations you did uh, uh, of Prouvé's uh, architecture. Um, and then Studio Drift, uh, which is also one that has been with you for, for many, many uh, years now, which is into uh, ephemeral or, or, you know, it, it disappears. It's, uh, it's light, it's, it's cultures of light. Uh, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's gone. Uh, so another uh, physicality of design. Yes, they, um, Studio Drift have been uh, working with flowers, but... Uh, and also different materials and the installation they, they've done in the sky with drones, with lights on, on them. So our moving uh, sculpture are quite phenomenal. I think I'd like to finish this conference on this image because it proves us how vast uh, design uh, and scenography and fashion and materiality can teach us in the future because looking at this image, what is it, you know, if you had to define it? And Studio Drift started with the most poetical installations, light installations with Dandeli, and, and people were looking at it and were like, is it design? Can I keep it? How is it going to stand the test of time? And we've looked uh, through this conference at how design, uh, a great design stands the test of time, whether it's from inspirations of Duchamp, whether uh, it's uh, sculptures that will stand the test of time, or denim that never kind of wears out, what that has been uh, designed to never wear out. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.